Assalamu alaikum, ya ahlu internet. So I'm going to tell you a story that you already know, but I don't think you really know it. It goes like this. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Tabbat yada abi lahabim wa tab. Ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab. Sayasla naran dhata lahab. Wa mra'atuhu hamma latal hatab. Fi jidiha hablum min masad. So once upon a time, there was a guy whose real name was Abdul Uzza. He was actually in line to become the leader of the religious elite of the city. Everything was awesome for him. He had a gorgeous wife. She was so beautiful that her name was actually Um Jamil. You know the Arabs, they'd like to give you a kunia. Your kunia is like your nickname, but it's not really a nickname because a nickname kind of denotes familiarity, but a kunia denotes respect. Like it puts a little bit of distance between you and the person. You're not like, hey, Abdul Uzza, you're like, Hey, Abu Lahab. Abdul Uzza's kunya was Abu Lahab because he was so fair-skinned that he had a kind of a rosy pinkness to his cheeks. So that would be kind of like calling him Mr. Flamey Cheeks, but respectfully. So Mr. Flamey Cheeks, the husband of the mother of beauty, Um Jamil, was doing good. He was an important guy. He was a good businessman. He had lots of kids. He was on his way waiting for basically his elder brother to die so that he could be in charge of the clan. Everything's fine until one day his annoying nephew, whose name happened to be Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, started preaching about this, you know, don't worship statues thing. Um, it was all a rumor because all the preaching was done in secret. But then one day Muhammad came out with his message publicly. And Abu Lahab was in the marketplace and from far away he hears Wa sabaha. That is the old timey version of an air raid siren. That's red alert. When there was something really, really wrong and you had to let everyone know, what you needed to do was climb up to a platform on the mountain of as and then call down into the valley. And your voice would echo all around the town. So everybody hears this call wa sabaha and they come running from everywhere and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam waits until there's a big enough crowd and then he says people what would you say to me if i told you there was an army on the other side of that mountain ready to attack you and they're like well we have no reason to disbelieve you we believe you and he's like well okay then let me warn you of an impending punishment from allah and they're like what and they look around and they look at each other and they're like hey banu hashim this guy's yours so they looked at the leaders of banu hashim like what are you gonna say and abu talib says let him say what he wants to say abu lahab on the other hand isn't interested in learning more his response is to pop up and be really mad and he's like the bun luck which means, may you be destroyed. It would be like saying to hell with you or a pox on you or something horrible like that. And then he actually tries to start climbing up the mountain so he can shove Muhammad down. Two interesting things happen at the same time here. One is that everyone loves a good show. So all the other Muslims are like, <laughs> let's climb up and shove Muhammad down. So some other people start climbing up with him. But then other people start climbing up to stop the people who are climbing up to stop them from pulling Muhammad down because guess what? They were secret Muslims. And nobody knew who was Muslim. And then all of a sudden people are like, hey, what are you doing there? Oh my God, you're Muslim. So then the people are pulling the other people who are trying to pull the people. And it was very embarrassing because the Meccans actually had guests over, which they often did. Makkah was full of religious tourists. They came to visit the Kaaba to pray to the idols. And all these religious pilgrims are watching what's going on and they're like, oh my God. You can, you can imagine what the neighbors said. The Quraysh were really, really embarrassed. It was a huge family fight. People were like, oh no. Um, so everybody dusts themselves off and they go home and they go about their regular business of finding and imprisoning and, and torturing the Muslims in their own family. Uh, Abu Lahab would probably have liked to do that, but Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was protected by Abu Talib, Abu Lahab's big brother. He was the actual leader of the Banu Hashim and he said, I'm not Muslim, but you know what? You don't touch Muhammad. No one's going to hurt him. Not on my watch. Uh, 
So Abu Lahab did the next best thing possible. He went about making Muhammad's life miserable in other ways. Um, he ordered his two sons, who were married to two of the daughters of the Prophet, to divorce them. And one of them, they both complied. One of them divorced his wife politely and sent her home. And the other one took his wife to the Prophet publicly and basically spat at the Prophet and threw his daughter back at her, which was not nice. And I mean, you know, you thought your in-laws were bad. Um, you thought your mother-in-law was bad. <laughs> um Jamil, the wife of Abu Lahab, got in on it too. And, you know, remember, she was this beautiful, rich woman who used to wander around Mecca with her with her beautiful necklaces on, making small talk, and hang out with the other real housewives of Mecca. She didn't really need to get in on the action, but she did anyways. And so she added gossiping about Muhammad to her regular gossip playlist. And then she added something to her nightly beauty regimen, where late at night she'd get out of bed for some invigorating car cardio, where she'd take a bunch of thorns and sticks and tie them up with a rope of palm fiber, hoist them up onto her shoulder, and then carry them next door and like distribute them around the house of Muhammad so that he would step on them to and from his way home. She'd do this in the middle of the night, you know, to increase the chances that he would actually get ambushed by a thorn. She would also toss garbage and animal poop over her wall and, you know, you thought your neighbors were bad. Um, time passed, things were rough. Uh, the Quraysh of Mecca forced the Muslims into a valley and put them under boycott. Functionally, they were in a concentration camp next door to their homes for three years. Um, when they finally got out, two really sad things happened. One is that Khadija died. May Allah be pleased with her. And the second is that Abu Talib died. And when he died, the leadership of the Banu Hashim passed to guess who? Mr. Flamey Cheeks. And as the leader of the Banu Hashim, his first order of business was to say, Oh, we're not protecting Muhammad anymore. And now it's open season. And where before the other Arabs were really annoyed by Muhammad's preaching, they couldn't do anything because they were afraid to start a civil war. And now they could have cut him down the streets if they wanted to. He had no protection. Abu Lahab even started following Muhammad around in the marketplace. And one time he threw rocks at him. It was really bad. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad went to Taif to seek another safe place. And we all know how that went. Badly, Taif went very badly. More time passes. Alhamdulillah, the Muslims migrate to Medina. Things are getting a little bit better. Allah gives them permission to fight back against the Quraysh for the first time. Before, they're just supposed to be polite and righteous and, you know, keep their hands to themselves. And that's for the first time they're given permission to fight back. Um, Abu Lahab didn't actually participate in the battle. Very leaderly of him. He actually paid someone else to fight in his stead. There was this guy who owed him 4,000 dinar. And he said, I'll forgive your debt if you go fight in my stead. And the guy's like, okay. So he did. So, you know how we said, Tabbat, may you be destroyed? In Old English, you might say to someone, a pox on you. If you've ever watched Disney's Robin Hood, you remember a pox on the phony king of England? Well, Abu Lahab got pox. He caught the pox shortly after the loss of the Battle of Badr. His entire body erupted in smelly, open sores. His family abandoned him in his own home. They were, they were afraid that they would catch whatever it is that he got. They would give him food by putting it on a plate and pushing it in there with a stick. Um, and when he died, his body lay there for three days untouched before the neighbors started complaining. And the sons were like, all right, I guess we got to do something. So they had some slaves slosh some water on him from a distance to wash him off. And using long sticks, they poked and prodded his body out to a hole and from a distance, they threw rocks and stones on top of him to bury him. And that was his end. Now, the verse says, Tabbat yada Abi Lahabim Wadab. Allah says, Tabbat to the hands of Abu Lahab, his actions, and Tabbat upon Abu Lahab himself. So that kind of came true in the sense that he died in a miserable state. Abu Lahab actually had 12 years alive after Muhammad started his message to convert to Islam. Why is this significant? Because if at any point Abu Lahab had raised his finger and said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, he would have disproved the Quran. Because the Quran says he's a disbeliever, he's going to go to hell, he's going to die, he'll be ruined. Well, if he converted to Islam, that he would kind of undermine the entire Quran, wouldn't he? I guess that never occurred to him, I'm not sure.
But ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab. Neither his children nor his wealth will benefit him in any way. For love or for money, no one would touch him. No one would help him. He died alone and miserable by himself in tremendous suffering. And he was buried in complete disgrace. Sayesla narun zata lahab. Mr. Flamey Cheeks, you're going to see some flames pretty soon. And his wife, who carried the wood, around her beautiful, lovely neck, will be a necklace of palm fiber, the same palm fiber that she used to tie up thorns with to throw them in the Prophet's path. Now, the story of Abu Lahab is important for us, even though we're not anti-Muslim, thorn-carrying, poop-throwing type people. See, Abu Lahab was related to the Prophet himself. He was a blood relative. But your relationship doesn't mean a thing. He was powerful, but power doesn't mean a thing. He was successful, success doesn't mean a thing. He was of noble Arab lineage. And that doesn't mean a thing either when it comes to your afterlife. Nothing is about your circumstances and everything is about your actions. None of these things were enough to save Abu Lahab. Your uncle is the imam of the masjid, good for him, what about you? Your brother's a hafiz, good for him, what about you? Your parents pray, good for them, what about you? Allah is not going to ask you about anything but your own actions. And no one has any claim to being religiously elite, religiously superior, of a, a finer religious caliber based on anything except their own actual religious practice and the contents of their heart, which guess only who can see? Only Allah can. And Allah knows best. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.